sorry, it looks like a dog. It's a cow. Do I just take these off or just fold them under? Or this? You cannot say that either. Right. Come on. Then. Okay. Brexit, the absolute state of the union. Robert, the Conservative and Unionist Party yes. has been in charge of Brit the British government now since <laughs> since uh, 2010. Yes. But Boris Johnson, it's Conservative and Unionist totally Prime unrelated. Minister, may go down in history, or not, as the Prime Minister who presided over the United Kingdom actually falling apart. It is... So I thought we should discuss this because it's not unserious. It is one of the ironies of the Brexit process that a, a plan designed to make Britain stronger and freer in the world could actually end Britain. Mm. So it's yeah, a big so issue. I'm just going to, while you're chatting, I'm just going to use my famous map making skills here to do England and Scotland. Yep. A bit like a tree, but mm -hmm. you know. And... As we've established, I'm not really in a position to criticize. <laughs> okay. And Some here people didn't like is... my fish last time. <gasps> People were rude about They're fish. just wrong. They're just, just wrong. I've completely shattered my confidence. So I'm not going to put any borders in right now because that's what we're discussing. Okay. okay. All right. So at the moment we have... Uh, hang on a minute. We've got the Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. We've got the UK encompassing Northern Ireland as well. Yes. But we've got some very, very, very unhappy Scots. And we've got uh, the Welsh kind of quietly getting Quite on with it because... They also voted pro Brexit. Quite a lot of angry English. Quite a lot of angry English, and then of course we've got um, we've got Ireland staying in the EU. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Republic of Ireland stays in the EU. Scotland very unhappy because it wants to stay in the EU mm -hmm. and is getting in a further boost to Scottish nationalism and to the separatist movement. And then we've got a lot of really uneasy outcomes to the Brexit process so far. Yes. In terms of how far Northern Ireland remains both in the UK yes. and in various European arrangements. So I literally, at this point, don't know where to put my European flag other than not on but the British we mainland. We could put it in Northern Ireland and pretend we'd come up with a Northern Ireland flag, which we didn't do. Well, but... Don't it, write in. <laughs> no, do write in, but only if you're going to... Yes, but to Miranda. So the whole thing is sort of up for grabs because mm -hmm. of the Brexit process. The most dramatic in the recent days has been huge changes in... The Republic of Ireland, yeah. where Sinn Féin, the Irish Nationalist Party, have done incredibly and well in, 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 their, in, in the elections there and could end up in government. And they are talking about pushing mm -hmm. the idea of referendums both in the Republic of Ireland and in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. for reunification of Ireland. So yeah. this is back on the agenda in a way that it hasn't been for a it, long time. It is, although there are two points that we have to make. One is that it is absolutely for the British government to decide whether this poll takes place, for the UK government, it, it has an absolute veto on whether that happens. In the, in the north. In, in the north, yes. Yeah. Uh, which, which, is, which therefore means it's of no use if you don't have that poll in the north. Secondly, although completely Sinn Féin are a nationalist party, it wasn't a wave of nationalist sentiment no, that true. got them elected or got them to their success in, in, in the Irish election. It's much more to do with the state of the Irish economy and anger with the two established parties. So... It will be interesting to see how they push this line. Even if they're in coalition yeah. talks, etc., will they make this some sort of red line or will they make a lot of they have noise to, about it? She's talked about having one within about five years, hasn't she? She said well, she wants one. During the last few days of the Irish election, she was talking about having one very fast indeed within mm. a year, but they seem to have slightly rode back on that. So who knows? And obviously in coalition yeah. negotiations... that will uh, Obviously what's interesting is if, if they do yeah. get into coalition in... The Republic, which, as we said, is, is not a guaranteed one, mm. they will be in government in both both sides of the Irish border, which is quite something. It really is quite something. So uh, the polling uh, I was reading shows that in the Republic, it's quite a healthy majority in favour of holding these referendums mm -hmm. in both parts of the mm -hmm. island. It's 57% in favour of actually consulting the people yep. in both areas. But as you say, the UK government decides whether that would go ahead in the north because of the Good Friday yep. agreement, and that's mm -hmm. there. And, in fact, Leo Varadkar, who's had a terrible time in the last few days because, obviously, he's been in government in Dublin, he has said that a referendum on unification would be really dangerous at the moment, would make a bad situation worse in the north because 
it's really quite unresolved still what happens to the economy in the north, what happens to the status of people in the north who were happy with the kind of equilibrium after the Good Friday Agreement but are now unhappy about Brexit. The Good Friday Agreement and being in the European Union, both Ireland and Britain, essentially calmed the whole Northern Irish question for quite yeah. a long time. Uh, apart from those who are most committed, for a lot of people, this is OK, we can live with this. It's going to be very interesting to see whether the terms worked out, for the special arrangements worked out for Northern Ireland, are enough to keep people content. I mean, as Dominic Robb hilariously said, they were a fantastic deal for Northern Ireland. So um, The ambiguity. Exactly. The so half in, half out. It is the, possible yeah. that when the dust settles, people look at it all and think, well, not much has changed. The issue, however, is going to be the border checks right. going from Northern Ireland to the British mainland. Okay, so what we should do is we should emphasise that the Brexit withdrawal agreement has actually inserted this, mm. which is a sort of customs border yeah. in the Irish Sea, yeah. a regulatory border, which Theresa May, when she was Prime Minister, said no British Prime Minister would ever agree to this sort of thing. Yes. But it has been agreed to, so it now makes the mainland UK different in its relationship to the EU to Northern Ireland. This is Completely. a huge deal. It is. It is. You know, I think we should build a bridge. <laughs> we should build a bridge. It'd be a good idea. Um, Who else thinks that's a good idea? The Prime Minister thinks it's a good idea. Um, so you're, that's completely right. And how this actually plays out... I mean, the Prime Minister's still actually denying there will be any checks. It's quite something. He is still denying checks altogether. We're going to have to see how this plays out. But, you know, the Unionist vote in Northern Ireland mm. is now not a majority of the population. Mm. The Unionist parties at the general election got 44%, I think it was, of the vote. Uh, they don't have a majority in the Stormont Parliament, which has been recalibrated. So, you know, the tide is against them. The hand they played in the Brexit process has not impressed anybody, including in their own community. It's a bit unfair to yes. talk about the percentages of the votes in the 2019 election because there were electoral pacts which confused it and actually slightly probably depressed the Sinn Féin vote. It's up for grabs there. Yeah. Just a few months ago, the DUP were still mm -hmm. these huge players yeah. in the Brexit negotiations because they'd been in coalition with the Conservatives propping them up yeah. at Westminster. Absolutely. Now, it's a totally different picture, and those hardline unionists in Northern Ireland have lost their influence. Yeah. And, I mean, it's curious. I mean, the, the, the Prime Minister's approach to Northern Ireland is curious. I mean, in, in the reshuffle that's happening, indeed, as we're recording, um, he has sacked the Northern Ireland Secretary, who secured the return of the Stormont Parliament, who finally got yeah. a deal within Northern Ireland that brought the parties back together and working together in devolved government. A man who's been described as one of the best Northern Ireland secretaries for a while, and Boris Johnson's just sacked him. So, Well, that's what you get for competence these days in modern politics. It, it, it is, counts um, for naught. Which suggests that the well-being of Northern Ireland is not top of Boris Johnson's ad agenda. I, I mean, although they would absolutely deny it, I've always believed there are very few people in government who really, really would fight very hard for Northern Ireland. Or even um, necessarily understand it that long, well. Well, indeed, who think long-term that its future lies um, with the Republic. Scotland, Scotland, on the other hand. Yeah, the Ireland issue is very live, but we'll have but to see how it plays need, out. We need to organise these flags for the yes. drone view. Yes, OK. So, <laughs> so, look, let's talk about Scotland, because yes. 2014... An independence yeah, referendum. Put Scotland on the wrong side. It's there. It's that. Well, that's point. in the that's, sea. Oh, I that's, see. oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> it's in yes. the sea. Um, so, 2014 was the Indy Ref, yep. as it's known. Mm -hmm. We don't know when we might get another one. Indy Ref two, mm. as it's known in the jargon, right? Yes. And Nicola Sturgeon, first minister of Scotland, has done incredibly well out of talking up the pro-European, the Remain nature of the Scottish electorate, mm -hmm. that, plus kind of the, the, the usual sorts of resentments against London, yeah. now resentments against a Tory government in London, this could really help her. But it's a delicate balance, isn't it, holding another referendum, because she doesn't want to hold Don't another lose. one that she loses, well, right? I mean, it's really interesting. In the UK Parliament, in the general election yeah. last year, in which the Scott Nats absolutely swept the board. They got 80% uh, of, the, of the seats at Westminster. They did it with around 45, 46% of the vote, again, which is roughly what, what, they, you know, what, what the independence vote was. It's roughly the same place. It is worth saying that the parties that supported independence did not win a majority of the vote in the UK general election, even with Brexit. Which is the SNP plus the Green plus the Party, Greens, yes. which is a separate entity well, who in, are the, in the north of the border yeah. and which is very pro-independence And as the well. Greens... Provide, allow the 
SNP minority government in the Scottish Parliament to function yeah. and would provide it with the votes for a, refer for a second referendum. Nevertheless, they don't yet have a majority for it. And I think the British government's position is very clear, which is to say we're not going to have a second referendum. And that position, I think, holds quite comfortably until the Scottish parliamentary elections next year in 2021. I mean, it's possible. There are people within the SNP who are challenging this and saying, let's hold a referendum without the British government's permission. Uh, Joanna Cherry, who played a really interesting role in the Brexit battles, is clearly quite a formidable legal brain, thinks there is a way to do it legally. But at the moment, Nicola Sturgeon's been pushing back on this. But she really doesn't want to do that, no. right? Because if you start going down that road, you potentially turn <laughs> Scotland into a sort of Catalonia, Catalonia. <clears throat> where holding referendums that are actually not legally allowed has led to, you know, appalling kind of brutality of, you know, imprisonment. It's lit a fire under yeah. the secessionist sentiment. That's not the way that Nicola Sturgeon, as yeah. leader of the SNP, wants to go. But she's got this balancing act, right, because she's got fundamentalists in yeah. her movement totally. and she's got people who think, look, we run Scotland, we will get there, it's yeah. our destiny, but not now. I don't think we're going to get to a place where uh, the British government is locking up Scottish nationalists, though undoubtedly Boris Johnson must have flirted with this in his quieter, quieter moments. I think the other issue probably about the Catalonia... He's probably written a column at some point, <laughs> let's face yes. it, the saying let's, let's imprison the SNP. I, I think that the other issue with, with the Catalonia um, comparison yeah. is that the key to a second referendum for Scotland would be saying we're going to break free and join the European Union mm. and what they don't want is a country like say Spain mm. vetoing their membership exactly. on the grounds of being an illegal separatist movement exactly. and encouraging the Catalans I think that would be them the other concern frankly but they is want that... to stay in right it's serious for oh, Scotland completely, they yes. really want to stay in the EU and this is also not just to do with a kind of you know we don't want to be part of a part of an exiled nation along with the hated English. Mm -hmm. This is to do with Scotland's economy. Scotland has a serious demographic it issue. Does. The population has been going down very fast and in terms of EU immigration has been very necessary yeah. in Scotland. So the end of freedom of movement is very bad, for example, yeah. north of and the border. I'm, and in general, Scotland voted quite heavily against Brexit. We have to yeah. keep, and, I mean, and not everyone, right? No, no. So, in recent opinion polls, yeah. we are seeing a majority, a very, very narrow majority for independence in Scotland, 51%, 52%, you know, that kind of thing. The other reason why I think Nicola Sturgeon rightly doesn't want to do this yet is that's not a big enough majority going no, in. Quite. You want, as you say, you can't have Indy Ref 3. So if you lose it this time, it's done. <laughs> and I think she would want to be more certain. And the logical thing for her to do, even leaving aside the political problems that the SNP has, which I'm sure we're going to come to, mm. is to spend the year stoking up the grievance, finding every possible way you can show that London is slighting Scotland, mm. build up that anger, mm -hmm. heading into the Scottish parliamentary elections in 2021 get a majority for the nationalist parties, which, and on the back of that, say, we're doing it, yeah. and defy the British government to stop you then. Which means that the single best way to stop a second Scottish referendum is to knock the SNP back in those elections, which okay. is a lot easier said than done. So that's really <clears throat> hard because of the collapse of the Labour Party in Scotland. So the SNP is in this incredible position. I mean, they've got a, a lot of kind of local difficulties, mm -hmm. right? Since they've been in government, which is a long time now, they've got problems with education standards, yep. they've got problems with the NHS, they've got problems with the police service. All of the kind of normal ways in which you would measure a government's competence and success... There are issues Plus, with, with the SNP. They had the resignation last week. The of their finance, finance minister, minister on the morning when she was supposed to deliver the budget. Inappropriate text for a 16 year old. You've got the looming trial of their former leader, Alex Salmon, which we can't really discuss uh, under contempt of court rules, but it's not going to be fun for the SNP, whatever happens. They've got lots of political gremlins coming their way, and yet their fundamental position remains very strong because they are essentially the only important voice of nationalism in Scotland. I mean, we've mentioned the Greens, but it's the SNP. We know that well that over 40% of Scots support that, which means they have a bedrock of support, which is very large and quite close to being able to give them a majority. And I think your point is exactly right about Labour. I think a Labour revival is the key to the SNP being stopped well, in let, Let's hope the, uh, the Labour leadership candidates are watching because they have a responsibility <laughs> to keep the union together in that, in that, res in that respect. We're unionist sentiment here. <laughs> unionist sentiment, no, never. Mm. But what the SNP is able to do is it's able to operate at the same time as a political party but also as a campaign. Yeah. What I find very interesting is the degree to which the Conservative Party has also managed in the last couple of years, or since Boris Johnson took over, 
to be the Brexit campaign and a political party. Yeah. Obviously, we know the Conservative Party is a kind of genius at reinventing itself to survive, adapt and survive. Mm. But now that Boris Johnson wants nobody to even mention the word Brexit anymore, mm. he's got to operate as a normal government and he's got to turn his attention to things like keeping the UK together. That is how he will be measured in the history books, right? If Scotland breaks away, it will be judged to be more significant than Brexit. Yes. And he will be judged as the man who lost the United Kingdom. And he knows this and it worries him deeply. And I think we're going to see quite a lot of effort from the British government, from Boris Johnson, to try and find ways to show Scots that the union is still worth keeping. But th the problem is... I'm just, that you're I'm, just, I'm just adding to the bridge because his ideas for keeping the union together yeah. at the moment seem to extend to saying he's going to build a huge bridge between Absolutely. Scotland and Northern Ireland, which may or may not um, be a sensible I mean, idea. One thing I think they want to show much more effectively mm. how much money um, Scotland gets from right. being this in the important. UK. Um, but I think the really interesting thing to me is that Boris Johnson, better than anybody else knows that the emotional argument of independence and, you know, take back control, he yeah. knows how good an argument that is, how powerful it is, and saying to Scots, oh, but look at all the money you're it, uh, rerunning Project Fear and being on the other side of the Brexit argument, as it were, is difficult. And it's, it's the great irony of any campaign that comes is you would have, you know, Boris Johnson and all the Brexiters saying, oh, don't break up the most successful political union of modern times. Um, don't uh, cut, yeah, don't um... cut yourself off from your largest market and you'll have Nicola Sturgeon, you know, the Brexit hating Nicola Sturgeon saying, no, come on, go for it, let us be free. So it's a complete inversion and we know at the moment which one of those arguments is seeming to be the most powerful. So there's another issue which sort of rumbles underneath these kind of immediate dramas, which is the issue of England mm. and the fact that the UK is actually quite imbalanced anyway, right? Because England is this huge landmass. There's a lot of GDP generated in London and the South East. And obviously, the UK Parliament is based in London at Westminster. And so this has always created resentment elsewhere, including in Wales. I'll just stick the Welsh back mm. on again for a second, include them in the discussion. There's also a kind of recognition in the Johnson government that you've got to do something about the other areas of England, which have felt left out, left out from the enormous amount of prosperity here yeah. in the South East. Does that help with this issue of keeping the union together? I don't know. When Alex Salmond was in charge of the SNP, I interviewed him and he was really sort of canny in talking, talking about the fact that the north of England was as angry with London as the Scots yes. were. This is also plays into the Johnson government's calculations about what they do next. It does. And I mean, and Nicola Sturgeon is at least as good as Alex Salmond was. I mean, she's a really first yeah, she's very, very good politician. Operator. Very good at this. And one of the things she's done with this, and one of the reasons for its success in my opinion, is not only the lure of the nationalist argument, but that they have occupied the progressive space in Scotland. So the No non longer the Tartan Tories, because exactly. they used to be, they known used to be as seen as, yeah. yes. um, So they have taken that space from Labour, mm. where, you know, if you are progressive, socially concerned, believe in social justice, the SNP is a comfortable party for you at the moment. And, they, and, and for take, younger voters, right, right, which is the future so electoral... So they have taken yeah. that space from Labour, and that's been the problem. The problem, in terms of the, the broader issue, is that... Scotland is overwhelmingly represented by, by Scottish nationalists in the UK Parliament, and it accounts for nothing. They're ignored completely by this government. It doesn't want to deal with them. And, in truth, they don't want to deal with it either. Whereas... Well, it's 4% Scotland... of the total yeah, UK correct. electorate, of course, so, yeah. That's absolutely true. Whereas, when, when the Labour Party was in power and electing lots of Labour MPs in Scotland, Scotland had a disproportionate yeah. clout. And yeah. that's been... And since that has eroded, since Labour took mm. it for granted, mm. that's been one of the things that has fuelled... Fueled the issue when you when when, when Scots really could look point, at actually, isn't it? when Scots could look at the British Parliament or the British government and see it was full of Scots arguing for their cause, you know that carried some clout. I mean they were still neglecting it very badly and taking it for granted, but it made a difference. Yes, um, that's a Labour rose wilting. I just I said I'm not yeah. in a position to criticise. <laughs> <laughs> I might just try meanwhile. Yeah. You know, um, so. I think that's, that's really hurt them. But the, pre the, the focus on England is really interesting. And the forces of English nationalism are really interesting because one of the things you see when you write about Scotland, when you talk about Scotland, is the back of, people, of English people going, oh, I don't care if Scotland goes, which seems you know, to us shocking that people could think so little. But there is a, a constituency of English opinion that doesn't care. And Boris Johnson is pandering to that constituency in other ways. So the danger is that that just grows in confidence. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I, I remember talking to somebody during the first referendum, the first indie ref, you know, who, who rather mischievously said, you know, well, Britain can do without, England can do without Scotland, you know, 
it's, it's state of its economy, England could grow it back in three years with economic growth. So, you know, there is a, there is a, a degree of contempt that goes both ways. And I think managing those forces is going to be difficult because if Boris Johnson starts throwing lots of money and love at Scotland, it may not go down well elsewhere where he's got to find money for that. For so that allows me to use my favourite word and to say that if Scotland leaves and Northern Ireland leaves, England and Wales become rump UK, known as R-U-K. Ruck. Rump. Rump UK. Mm -hmm. It seems to me completely absurd. You know, it's a small set of islands off the coast of Europe and all these things may come to pass, but the idea that it wouldn't matter of course, is fanciful. It is ridiculous. Even, it, I mean, even it, just economically, uh, rather than in terms of the kind of impoverishment of our identity as Britons. Yeah, I mean, look, there are, I, mean, I, don't, you know, I think the risk of Scottish independence is very real, but it's yeah. not a given. It's yeah. not a fact. Yeah. And I, you know, I know some, some Conservatives I was talking to last week about when I was talking about the subject, were saying, you know, we don't know if we can stop a referendum, but actually we're not as gloomy as you, as you might imagine about it. There are some very strong arguments, including the one that says, look what's been going on in our country for three years with Brexit. Do you fancy <laughs> three years of that in Scotland? Do you fancy that degree of chaos? And th the nationalists are going to have to answer some difficult questions, like what's the currency, which undid them last time. You know, if you join the EU, you have to commit to joining the euro. That may not be a popular position mm. among lots of us. But the key to me is it's the unionist remainers. Yeah. The people who voted unionist last time voted for t to stay with the UK but also wanted to remain in the European Union. And those are the vulnerable target vote. The people who thought that they could, that Scotland would have a say and a voice and, in fact, have seen the most important issue of the day, they've been ignored. So it's a very, very powerful argument for the nationalists. And, you know, if we get into this referendum, then, you know, the unionists have got a real fight on their hands, which is why the single best way to win it is to not get in it. Which means... Which means avoiding... Well, to me, it means Labour choosing the right leader. Yeah. Labour then choosing a better leader in Scotland and showing to Scottish voters that they are a force to be taken seriously again. Well, there's only because one Labour MP left only in one Labour Scotland. MP, He's right. actually making a very good fist of arguing yeah. that he should be deputy leader, I would argue, at the moment. Yes. But maybe he'll get a proper job. I think he probably will. But they've also then got to get Ian a good Murray. leader. Ian Murray. They've also then got to get a better leader than Richard Leonard in Scotland. They don't have to do very much. I mean, the, the, the Scottish Parliament is quite pretty. You know, the SNP is two sheets short of a majority. The Greens have six ME, uh, MSPs, I think. So you don't have to knock them back very far to take away the majority for a referendum. But the Tories did very well last time, and you might wonder if they're going to do as well again, certainly without their charismatic mm. leader, Ruth Davidson. Mm. But a Labour boost would make a real difference. If I was the Dominic Cummings of unionism, I'd be working out how I could boost the Labour Party in Scotland, because I think that's the key for holding the union together. So, after our last uh, video, somebody wrote in and very sweetly said, because you, you drew some magnificent fish last time, Robert. Do you remember a your, fish, yeah, people, your torpedo really rude foot about fish? my fish. They were very rude about my fish. And I think we, we, we had some, some excellent feedback about, yes. your, about your fish, so I'm going to draw them today. Yeah, OK. <laughs> So Earl of Mar wrote, what do the fish think? To which the answer is obviously they're gutted. Oh, uh, no. Terrible. So there's a confused fish not yes. knowing. Is it a British fish? I mean, is it a European th fish? To, to be serious for a moment. The, um, <laughs> again, one of the things that um, one of the unionist people I spoke to last week said to me was one of the fundamental issues is going to be how we secure a deal on fish in the Brexit negotiations. And if the Scottish Federation is even close to... Sta Fishing Federation is even close oh, to yes. standing up and saying... better do a Scottish fish, actually, because it's Scottish... very, very, very important in Scotland, the fishing okay. industry. What's the difference? It's just up north. Is yeah. That... OK. Yeah. Um, if the Scottish Fishing Federation is a... stands up and says, you sold out fish for London's financial services, we're in real trouble. And therefore, you have the situation where the deal that is done for fishermen is going to be disproportionately important to the future of the UK, even though the future of the fishing industry is very unimportant to the British economy, though many would argue it's tremendously important in cohesion and in the local economies. What the fish think, I don't know, but people are certainly thinking about the fish. OK, I'm trying, and not very well, to draw an Irish cow over here. OK, why are you doing that? Because... Oh, because it because, you know, if we're, if we're worrying about what do the fish think, I also want to know what the Irish cows think. Well, it does say here, how is this border down the Irish Sea going to work? It would seem to create lots of smuggling opportunities. And you can see that's right, because look, very, there are gaps question. in our border where people can... <laughs> where, where the smugglers will go through like that. Um, but, but also there's this famous Ian Paisley quote from years ago, which is, our people are British, but our cows are Irish. Right. 
which was taken as a sort of... When, when Boris Johnson started quoting in Paisley saying that, we thought that there might be something going on in terms of yes. compromise Is that about a Paisley the... Paisley cow? Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's, mm. it's an Irish cow yes. tended to by... British farmers right, in the okay. Northern Ireland, that's the point. Okay. So, because, you know, this like bit... It looks like a dog. I'm sorry, it looks like a dog. <laughs> it's a cow. It's a dog. Um, but so how does this actually work, this dis different arrangement for Northern Ireland? Because, you know, as you've said, even government ministers have said, potentially Northern Ireland gets quite a good deal here. Yeah. I mean, the key thing is... Economically. The checks aren't going to take place here, of course. I mean, you know, not least because no-one wants to sit on that particular border. But um, <laughs> they're going to take place on the mainland in Northern Ireland, they're going to happen away from the border, away from the area's attention as much as possible. There's going to be lots of certification and... Because of the peace process and wanting to keep process. the peace process intact, because in the past, yeah. anything that looked like a border, that looked like a checkpoint, became a yeah. terrorist target, yeah. and that's a serious issue. But, I mean, issue. the issue is going to be this is things going from Britain to Northern Ireland. That's going to be the fundamental area where there's an awful lot to be pinned down. The European Union is incredibly serious about the sanctity of the single market yeah. and it isn't going to let the British That's government get away European with flag ignoring here, this. So, clear. although, I mean, they talked in terms of not wanting to be bloody about this and wanting to find ways to de-escalate this issue and, and take the emotion out of it, there are going to have to be checks assuming this backstop comes in, which I think we all think it will, or front stop or whatever we call it now. So they're going to happen at factory level. There's going to be a lot more paperwork. I think the clear hope is to get something like trusted trader schemes where it's all accepted. But the issue is going to be, you know, what if you're sending things to the Northern, to Northern Ireland, some of which is for the North and some of which isn't? Um, so it's, it's got a lot of work to be done on it, I think it's fair. OK, well, I'm going to finish then by drawing a lot of red tape, I think. Because uh, I've got this question. What's that? How do you think Brexit will be taught in the future curriculum? Will it be taught like Suez? Thank Drake, you, Drake, Drake Rose. Rose. Let's hope not. I think is the only answer. Well, that would be very negative. I mean, I think that we really have yet to know because we don't know how the EU might start to change over the next mm. few years. It may be that Brexit is a chapter in a much more complicated story about well, Europe. Fair. I also, as you've already said, Robert, think that if what happens is that the United Kingdom starts to break up, that's a much more dramatic historical moment and Brexit yes. becomes a factor, the probably the factor. I just studied history, a uh, part of my degree, and all the way through. And one of the things I used to remember looking at was the history books and, you know, these little paragraphs, particularly when you did... Like GCSE, like here's a paragraph on the lead up to the First World War, and here's a paragraph on the Great Reform Act, and you think, God, I hope there aren't that many paragraphs about the time I'm living in. And up until a few years ago, <laughs> there, there weren't going to be that many paragraphs about the period we live in. Mm. Uh, now, you know, um, now there are. It's this, what's the old line? We know, happy the land that doesn't need heroes. So, yes. Um... Well, the curse, the Chinese curse <laughs> of living in interesting times, certainly applies. So look, I'm just going to do this as a final gesture. I'm just going to draw a lot of red tape <laughs> everywhere. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me the one thing that we have found out in the last few weeks is there is going to be the F word. Friction. Friction. And it ain't going to be easy. No, there's going to be... Def and once you accept some friction at the border, a lot of the rest of it becomes easier for the government to decide on. Because it's, once you accept there's going to be regulatory checks, there's going to be delays at the border, however efficient it is, you're going to have to hire more customs officers, build more customs posts, and all that kind of stuff. And so once you accept that's going to happen then your path is, is largely set. The only thing to be said, of course, is that part of this government strategy is to talk as tough as possible at this part of the negotiation process. Yeah, it's not over. So that, you know, it's taken seriously. I mean, the European Union has seen that movie before and coped, but we'll, we shall see what happens. But the truth is, how this goes is crucial to how this goes. Absolutely. Well, all I can say is it's a mess and I'm not just talking about our piece of paper. We're doing origami. Thanks very much for watching, and if you like these videos, you can subscribe by clicking on the FT logo. You can click on the subscribe button. You can like us. You can like us. You could even like us. And if you want to ask a question or leave a comment, particularly a friendly comment, please do so. What is that? <laughs> it's a thumbs up. What's wrong with this? Go around your thumb. Oh, she's so much better at this than me.